Um, so in the conference room in upstairs, and there will be uh, moving GNOME to another reality talk. And in this, in this room, yes, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. we have uh, famous GNOME shell developers, Georges, That's uh, me. <laughs> Marco, yes. uh, Carlos, and Jonas, about the state of the shell. Please welcome. Okay. Good afternoon. Um, I hope not a lot of people get to sleep after the lunch. So, <laughs> my name is Georges. Um, we are going to present um, today about the state of the shell, which is essentially what happened between the last state of the shell and the current state of the shell last year in last WEDEC. Um, yeah, let's go. <laughs> so, I'm going to, lots of things that are presented here are. Um, many things that are presented here are not actually made by us, but um, contributions that we revealed. So proper um, credits are going to be given. So let's start. So let's start with implicit animations. Um, one of the r most recent um, bigger changes that Lyndon Shell was done with Florian, um, and it's his work on implicit animations, um, which is essentially when animations run in GNOME Shell, we use it to use Tweener, which is a JavaScript-based um, animator framework. And now we are using directly clutter um, animations. Why does that matter? Um, essentially, when we are using Tweener, we need to run stuff in JavaScript, which means lots of transitions between um, JavaScript and C, and that's, well, that's costly more on the CPU side than the GPU side, but that's costly still. With the clutter animation framework, we just, we reduce a lot of jumpings between, a lot of trampolines between uh, JavaScript and C, and that should have uh, a noticeable um, improvement in how much CPU does GNOME shall use. Um, the second important feature that is still on GNOME shell side of things is folder management and custom grid. Um, so now it's possible to create and delete folders using drag and drop within GNOME Shell. Um, previously, this was a feature in GNOME software, and apparently almost, no, a lot of people didn't know about it because it's super hidden inside GNOME software. Um, I put an image here, but my plan was to actually showcase you how does that work so I can grab something, um, let's say two boxes, and you can see that there's a very smooth animation here due to clutter implicit animations. <laughs> and when you drag and drop, you create a folder. It's always um, sorted alphabetically, so still a named folder. And you can delete the folder by dragging everything out of it. Of course, renaming will come before 3.34. Um, it seems so easy and, and, and you know, obvious now, but <laughs> people are waiting for this for the past seven years in GNOME Shell. Um, so yeah, it, it's coming. Um, and the next target now is custom app grid. Um, we are actually targeting this in, for GNOME 3.36 um, because we require deeper changes in GNOME Shell because with a custom app grid you have a much more interactive user experience and the app grid currently is very, it's so much hidden under layers and layers. Um, and by, by making it interactive, it needs to have a more central place in the GNOME Shell experience. And furthermore, it will need to rethink um, various concepts of GNOME Shell because um, with a customizable app grid, you basically have um, the, the favorites is in the app grid, so what's the role of Dash uh, after introducing this? So all these questions are being considered, um, and we're planning to tackle this big task for 3.36, the 3.36 release. Thanks to my employer analyst that allows me to <laughs> use my work time to do that. Um, now on mother side of things, um, one of the things that landed, and it's really important, um, for everything else that we're going to talk about in this presentation is the sysproof work, um, which was actually bootstrapped by 
Jonas and Christian in the Performance Hack Fest last year, um, but I took the liberty to take it over and complement it and finish it. And it allows us um, to interactively, interactively see um, the layout and painting cycles of GNOME Shell and figure out what are the bottlenecks of rendering and presenting um, stuff in your screen. And yeah, this is how it looks right now. Um, you can see here that um, we have a very detailed information about each step of the rendering. Um, I, I actually took a very bad example because um, you can see that swapping the frame buffers is taking a lot of time and none of these, um, so you can, see, you can see here that the update is missing the 16.666 millisecond mark which means we are not running at full 60 FPS yet. Um, this is an old older um, picture because now we actually hit this much more frequently. Um, and more importantly, we can know about it now reliably. Um, also, sysproof allows us to have some very nice frame timing information. And that opens the doors for, I don't know, putting some CI routines in order to check that we don't regress in the frame timings or anything like that. Yeah, so this is, um, the sysproof work is important for all this trending performance stuff that has happened, that's what's happened um, during the past year. But on another area, we have the render nodes and clutter content stuff, which is well, a render node, when GNOME Shell renders itself, it uses Clutter. And using render nodes means that we, we get the painting operations, like paint this black rec rectangle here, we collect these operations, and then we apply them after collecting the whole tree. Um, currently, we do um, kind of an immediate mode, something that Cairo does, for those who know GTK. So when you tell it to paint, it paints immediately instead of storing a render node, a, a painting operation. Um, well, doing this, moving, to, moving towards a rendering tree in, allows us, will allow us to um, another series of um, performance improvements, in, improvements in general, not only related to performance, um, like optimizing the render tree, removing nodes that are not necessary, um, sharing paint nodes so we can get rid of Clutter Clone, which is a massive hack inside Clutter that makes our lives so much harder to, to live. And also in the far future, we, cannot, we can even think about threat offloading. So getting all the painting operations of Clutter, submitting it to a thread and ren rendering it in a thread. So essentially threaded rendering, that's a very far future that I'm talking about, but with this, it might be a, possible, a possibility. Um, and Clutter content is essentially a way, a structured way, to use um, those render operations, those render nodes. Um, this cycle, we are lending um, a very big um, Clutter content implementation, which is meta-shaped texture. Um, probably one of the hardest ones to port, um, and next cycles, we'll see much more improvements, advancements in this area. Um, also in the list is Graphene. This is actually uh, targeted for GNOME 3.36. Um, Graphene has some cool optimizations, um, and we will probably, um, it's gonna affect GNOME Shell quite a lot because we do a lot of matrix, matrix um, calculations and Graphene is pretty good at it. So. I didn't measure anything yet, but uh, it should be um, a, a considerable improvement, especially on the CPU side of things. Um, and the last thing that I uh, want to talk about is the, frame, the improved frame scheduler, which is a contribution from Canonical's Daniel von Vogt. Um, it's a series of merge requests um, that essentially achieve the following. So currently, Mutter paints following um, a specific cycle. So we give, you can see that um, there is a small space here after 
your monitor tells Mutter that Mutter can draw something there. Um, we wait a little bit, and then if we need it to paint, which is this green area here, then we can paint and put the new content on your monitor. Um, you can see from this um, super scientific chart that it's a very small area. So the achievements that we've made during the cycle is to allow this. So if something um, makes clutter or GNOME shell trigger a repaint, later in the cycle, we can still achieve it. We can still show that frame, which reduces the number of skipped frames, which improves the smoothness of animations in GNOME shell, etc. So yeah, that's all from my side. Yes, it's you. And now it's my turn. So uh, touched on this slightly last year, and this is the, what happened since then. Uh, so for you, you, you don't know, a KMS is the kernel mode setting. It's what we used to uh, shove things onto the hardware in the native backend used by the Wayland session. Uh, so in the previous version, it pretty much looks like this. We render and we uh, send various commands to the kernel and it, it implements the commands and if we're lucky, it does, it does the, um, finish all the commands before a uh, frame of the monitor. Uh, the problem with this, I'll uh, get onto a bit later, but this is how it looks in the past and in the newer version we introduce a, a kind of transaction system that you, that takes uh, all the commands that GNOME Shell does, which is configure the monitor and uh, schedule a, fra a, a frame uh, and puts it in an object. And then we can use this object and apply all the changes more atomically. This is what we have uh, managed to finish for uh, 3.34. The goal is to be able to uh, use a new kind of kernel API called atomic mode setting that does all this, uh, all the commands in one, one, in one go so we can use various new features that is not possible on the old one. Uh, so why, why do we want to do this? The point is to be able to switch between using various hardware optimizations. For example, if we want to implement uh, putting uh, surfaces, I mean client contents in the uh, hardware overlays, we cannot do this without being able to atomically apply a, a kernel mode setting state in one go because it might mean that we put uh, some content in an overlay and then we draw the frame and there will be a, a page flip in the middle and then we show the half the frame. Or for example, if you want to use, uh, we want to implement uh, color management if you have a non-full screen window that you want to color manage in a certain way, we can use shaders, but then you want to make that full screen and then the way it will be done more efficiently is to set gamma rays and uh, set various properties on the kernel objects. That's also something that is you, we would be needing the uh, atomic mode setting. And uh, also the cursor plane, even though that's not as important because you usually don't switch between the hardware and the software open geo cursor plane. Uh, there's also certain uh, features that is pretty useful. There's this thing called DRN modifiers, which, use, is, which is used to create buffers that are more efficient for the, for the graphics card to uh, send the content to the hardware. The problem is that if you just try to use the efficient ones, you don't know if it's going to work because there's memory bandwidth issues. So we can use the atomic mode setting to uh, try to see if the configuration works and then we can s switch around in the modifiers and things like that. Uh, and then we can use, for example, compression which will increase certain performance things. Uh, another thing that this uh, transaction uh, object thing is it's implemented with a thread safety in mind, which means that we should be able to eventually create certain threads that does things separately so we don't have to block on, on compositing to, for example, update the cursor uh, position. Uh, this is all the major thing that we have done for this 
since uh, last year is to introduce this transactional object in all the configuration of the kernel mode setting state. And that was, this will enable us to uh, use the atomic mode setting uh, API. But we still have to support the old one because uh, the legacy API will still only be supported by certain hardwares, for example, the NVIDIA driver. Uh, what we sh hopefully will have ready for 3.34 is the full screen unredirect, which will use the, the hardware plane for a full screen window, which is already supported on X11, but it's something that this new uh, transactional object will enable us to do. Um, another thing that happens this last time is GPU hot plugging. There are uh, two kinds of GPU hot plugging, more or less. The originally was introduced by uh, Collabora and DisplayLink to support the DisplayLink kind of devices, which is you put a USB thing into the USB uh, uh, plug, and then you have some kind of uh, wireless method to transfer content to a monitor. That is effectively inserting a, a KMS device, a GPU without a GPU. Uh, that also brought support for hot plugging GPUs from, a, for example, a docking station. Uh, it works more or less the same way as the uh, existing multi-GPU uh, paths works, uh, the ones that uh, use Intel and a G NVIDIA GPU, or an Intel and an AMD GPU. So it was a lot of things that were used, uh, and uh, with some extra uh, hardware acceleration paths for the display link paths. Another thing that was added last, since last year uh, was is screencasting by Olivier Fordon. Uh, it, it's the same kind of screencasting that, you, that is used for the, the whole screen screencasting, meaning pipe wire. Uh, there is an in-progress portal uh, support for this as well in the GK portal backend. Uh, it's also used for UI testing with Dogtail. Yep, that was That's my turn. <coughs> yeah, so, well, this is uh, the bit I've been working on lately, uh, x and on demand, uh, so you know, uh, well, you know how Genome Cell uh, traditionally was. It was an X11 client, an X11 compositor, and it, it pretty much was an X11 client forever. So then it became a Wayland compositor, uh, a bit of a history lesson, pointless, but still worth it. Uh, it became a Wayland compositor, and it was both at the same time, actually. It was an X11 compositor and a, a Wayland compositor. So this work has been on making actually X Wayland optional uh, in order to, to be a pure Wayland compositor and have it raise X Wayland on demand whenever an X11 client is needed because the, the, the user launches one. Launches one. Uh, there's been many other miscellaneous things that have improved uh, together with this because we have a genome settings daemon and other set of daemons doing uh, quite a lot of X11 stuff uh, and, well, basically offloading some, some, some duties from the from, from the compositor, but well, we've been shuffling that lately uh, and moved some things into the compositor and made uh, genome settings demon lighter on, on other roles. So we have things like pointer accessibility that was uh, on settings demon and moved into the shell. We have pointer location, which was was in genome settings demon and moved into the in, into the shell again. We have clipboard management, which very much the same. And, well, that meant that uh, the X11 usage in genome settings demons uh, and other demons uh, have reduced quite a lot. We essentially have uh, currently uh, GSD X settings, uh, which is an X11 client because it must be, uh, because X11 clients want, want those settings, and that must stay. But everything else in genome settings demon is pretty, uh, uh, window wind agnostic currently and well we also have uh, 
some other miscellaneous demons like Pulse Audio, uh, it still launches X11 on, on, on the back uh, in order to, to write a few properties, in order to read them later from other clients and whatnot. That should improve. Uh, there's already some patches for that. Uh, things are being discussed, uh, but well, uh, the, this is not that much uh, under my domain. So yeah, things are uh, a bit slower over there, but things are shaping, shaping along. And it has involved also multiple refactors in matter code. Uh, as I told, uh, it was a, a, an X11 client, and we've been wh while running. Uh, I mean. I could compare this to changing a car wheels while having it running, basically. We've made it a Wayland compositor and we've made it a pure Wayland compositor and that has involved many internal refactors. They were, the, the bulk of them were initiated by Armin Kresovic in summer of 2017? 17, yeah. He did a, a quite a lot of work but it was still, uh, well, uh, that there was the, the last mile, which was uh, a bit longer than a mile. <laughs> but yeah, that's what has been done lately. Uh, and it uh, still doesn't mean uh, we are done, uh, that there's uh, still many refactors to come and many things where we have in common code uh, some X11 behavior which should move into, into the X11 parts of the code and, and whatnot. But yeah, well, uh, it already works, uh, which is uh, a, a quite a milestone, in my opinion. And this also means that n uh, the no X11 toggle that you can pass to Matter uh, also works. It used to work only for Matter, but if you would run Genome Shell with it, it would fail miserably because uh, Genome Shell still relies on X11 things for many things. But now it works again. And if you want to enable it on demand, you just have to, to, to run uh, to, to set uh, an experimental feature. It will be enabled by default in the future, but so far it's, it has been set. Uh, so, well, uh, we, we prefer to, to keep things experimental so far until we deem it proper. And how it works? Well, uh, Matter basically, uh, it used to launch X Wayland, so X Wayland would already set up a socket and, and set the, well, uh, we would set the environment variable on its behalf, but, uh, well, uh, Wayland was running forever, but now what happens is that Matter sets up uh, the display socket, set, it sets the environment variable, so to clients, it looks like there's a, 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 an X server, but there's not. Matter then listens to anything on that socket, uh, waiting for anything to come, it doesn't really care about the protocol, it doesn't really care about na anything, it just wants to see something o on the socket, and then when something arrives, it launches a Wayland, it passes it that socket, and then the X Wayland uh, can launch, can talk to the client, can have it spawn, and at the same time, Matter is talking uh, also with X Wayland, setting itself up as an X11 compositor, as it used to do, and uh, launching related X11 things like X settings that I mentioned before and whatnot. And it runs until, well, you can launch uh, random X11 processes and whatnot, and after the last uh, X11 client exits, uh, for example, you launch Xterm and you close it, it waits uh, a small while and then it does the very opposite steps. It stops the services, it shuts down uh, itself as a compositor, it closes the display connection, and then it's, it kills the X Wayland process. And, but it keeps exporting the display socket and the display for in, in order to, to trick future clients to connect again, and then the same would happen. This can still improve slightly. Uh, we have uh, some clients that uh, really should uh, run before the client. Uh, some things just cause glitches like X settings and whatnot, but there's other uh, clients that uh, are more fundamental to run before the client because they write uh, root window properties and stuff that clients just read, they don't uh, want notifications about. 
So it's something that must happen before the client uh, runs any single line of code, really. Uh, this needs a little help from SQL, and there's uh, already some patches to, to have it uh, a side channel that we can use for these services. And then the, the X11 client that the user launches is stalled uh, until that happens. And then after la everything is launched, then X Wayland just picks that socket and processes it uh, as usually after all the related demons and whatnot, they are launched. And another thing that might be good to improve is uh, resilience to X Wayland crashes. Uh, some say it crashes a lot, some say uh, you know, it crashes more and, and whatnot, but it's still a, a source of possible crashes. So the idea here would be to handle XIO error elegantly, uh, which is kind of hard because Lith X11 uh, really, really, really wants to shut down your process after it. So yeah, it needs some Lith X11 changes, uh, either extra API or something we didn't figure out yet. But it, it can be made to work and yeah. Uh, and after something happens, uh, we, we should be still be able to order Lisa down uh, and whatnot. Then there's also this small change, uh, well, uh, real-time scheduling. Uh, well, this is twofold, actually. We have uh, now some toggle. Uh, th this is an experimental setting again. Uh, so Genome Shell uh, pumps uh, its scheduling priorities up, so we, it m manages to run uh, at a higher priority than regular processes. And that would mean that, uh, well, for example, uh, Chrome 2 in CPU, uh, like math, that it shouldn't affect Genome Shell being fluent and whatnot. This is one part of the change, but the other part of the change is high priority EGL context, which basically is the same, but on the GPU side. So you create a context which uh, has a higher priority in the EGL driver. So any drawing command has pr a priority over, over other clients and, and whatnot. And the purpose is again, if you run a game, uh, then you know, so starts being not not being that fluent, but uh, we want Genome Shell to be, uh, to, to, to have enough priority to push those frames to the, to the screen. So it doesn't make sense to give all the GPU to the, to the client if it's Genome Shell which is putting those frames in your display. That's the main principle behind it. This change with EGL was uh, done by Ajax, uh, Adam Jackson. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I got the name right. Uh, yeah, so yeah, that's mostly it. This is what's always a mind. Yeah. Um, there's other miscellaneous rendering improvements. Uh, for example, we, well, uh, th there's this improved calling. Uh, we have uh, some, some object for some specific actors in the genome cell hierarchy which uh, implemented an interface uh, that it was so because the windows are stackable and whatnot, you, you may want to skip painting portions of, portions of the windows which are behind other windows because it's meaningless to draw them if, if they are not going to end up on, uh, on the display. So that kind of worked, but uh, well, uh, th th there was uh, some places where, uh, well, where we were still painting more than necessary. So the, the, the checks uh, to, to do that are now a lot more stricter. So yeah, well, we now just try to paint the essential. And the goal he, here it was, for example, you have a, a one full screen client uh, and genome cells should be sending just a rectangle with a texture with that you don't want it to paint the background, you don't want it to paint other windows behind. Uh, and whatnot, you, you, you want to paint it, that rectangle. And that's what's been achieved, mostly. Uh, I mean, we already have uh, uh, well, uh, invalidation regions, which means we don't paint the full screen every time. So we can paint a small client, 
but it is uh, rectangular, so we, do, we don't have to bother what's behind or and whatnot. Before, we used to push like 14 to 16 rectangles, and now we push one, which is a small win. And another change, this was from Daniel, uh, Daniel Van Puth. So yeah, this was to actually use the monitor refresh rate. Uh, we used to have a fixed clock which was running at 60 frames per second, uh, which is usually the good thing for most monitors, but uh, yeah, well, uh, we, the, the, there's better monitors n nowadays. So yeah, well, we, we can now support them uh, at the native refresh rate. Okay. Uh, uh, fractional scaling support in Gnome Shell is, I think, going for a few cycles now. It basically started, I think, on the third, uh, 328 before cycles by Yunus, who started all the preparation stuff for creating basically configuration for having monitors of different scaling and all the system then to, to use frame buffer scaled monitors. So uh, every monitor can be scaled independently. Um, starting from these, basically we um, we wanted to implement uh, also the fr uh, fractional scaling, basically uh, reusing these but making the clients to basically draw at the maximum scaling which is possible, considering the inter intersecting monitors they hit, and then we draw them back, down basically depending on the, on the frame buffer scaling we apply. So basically this is how it works, and it works then for clients like GDK clients and then the shell. The shell support was missing basically till the 332 uh, cycle because we were uh, not painting the, the actors with the contents with the actual scaling, so we introduced the resource scaling thing which allows basically an actor to to paint all the, 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 the visual elements at the proper scaling. And so we finally have a no blurs shell again. This is still an experimental uh, feature. Uh, it can be enabled by G setting key. Is definitely, well, stable so far, although uh, we still have to do things. Uh, so mostly optimizing, for example, the result scale computation, or well, maybe changing the way to approach to that. But um, there are still some some proposals to in order to avoid recomputing things all the times because this is a performance hit according to the sysprof analysis we did. Um, so, and the most pointer scaling is um, has to be improved uh, to use more hardware. Are uh, pointers when possible, and uh, Robert is actually helping with that. Um, then we, one thing is improving also the detection of the scaling value and the automatic value we, we're gonna use for for, uh, for 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 each monitor, and for that will be nice also to define like uh, an API that OEM can use in order to basically tell matter how this particular laptop what we freshly scaled. Um, and most of it actually, a most big uh, work items we have is actually x and clients which need lots of love. Uh, basically so far they are just stretched up and so all blurred. Uh, there are various ideas how to implement this, still we didn't start a proper one and well, we need to, to get the hands dirty and finally deliver this. Um, uh, although uh, in something else we, we uh, personally did, like on, um, for mostly for Ubuntu front, because we, we want to still to deliver XORG, and so trying to get fractional scaling up using basically native matter. Um, and this is still possible in some ways using X11 extension and X render, although the performance are not like the, the same, we can achieve in way landward, still there more than acceptable thanks to the fact now all the drivers basically using Glamour to, to, to do all this and so it's eventually still GL uh, skilled. And so basically we can still do the same by using another way around uh, way of scaling the, the, 
the interface, so we basically scale up across all the monitors with the maximum scaling and then we scale down for for each for each monitor. It works and there's experimental branch and it's, it can be enabled in Ubuntu with a G settings key, but uh, also uh, we, I mean, the branch is done for proposing, so we'll see if you can get in there. Basically, it doesn't touch anything apart from applying more X configuration and making, they're using the same things we had for, for Wayland applying to, to go, uh, X11 with a different, basically, layout, monitor layout, but that's not changing the world. Um, on shell side, uh, this is not really like, this is more like uh, some cleanups, let's say code cleanups, but I mean, we're talking about here because like, there might be some uh, people like uh, interest. Um, the, this all started in the, the past cycle, thanks to Georges, who basically dropped all the, the shell generic container uh, usage it was introduced because basically GJS was able to, to um, was able to uh, override the virtual function, G object virtual function directly on the on the clutter actor. So basically, we were in the shell. There was uh, this shell generic container which was translating the V function to signals and delivering them to the JS objects, creating some more you know bottleneck, let's say. So we can see here in the graph how just, you know, removing these, the performance and frame rates improved. And this started with that, and then now we're continuing this cleanup by basically moving from composing all the classes in, in JS to inheriting them. And uh, this is already the case for in 3.34 for a mono di model dialogue and uh, items, but we might do for all the other actors around, so uh, removing the delegate pattern we were using, so basically uh, referring to the to the to an, uh, the actor was referring to the actual container to in, or, in order to to um, to have a kind of connection in between the JS object and the, the actual G, uh, JS uh, wrapper over the G object. Um, this is something we want to l remove, basically, and so we are doing that, although extensions writer might be someone aware, should be aware of this, because they might change a part, part of the extensions, and instead of using the, the normal, the, the normal, let's say, ES6 classes ex extension, they should use the G object wrapper around it, uh, provided by GJS. Uh, it's not big work, but still a few things to do, otherwise the extension won't work. Um, and that's it, so questions? So now that we're hitting the 16.9 millisecond target for rendering each frame so we get a smooth 60 frames per second, um, is the next landmark going to be something like uh, 8 or 6 milliseconds so we could do uh, high frame rate displays and render the, render the shell at the correct fr uh, frame rate for those displays? And if not, how much work would need to go into getting it down to that. Yeah, so this is a complicated topic because um, um, well the book of the questions that GNOME, sh the book of the problems that GNOME Shell um, does not aim to reach 60 FPS. GNOME Shell aims to not miss any singular flame, frame. It doesn't matter if your animation only has 10 frames, we are not going to achieve 60 frames because your animation only has 10 frames. But we want to not miss a single frame of these 10. Um, what we were talking about, what, what I had in mind when I wrote this slide deck is um, we have various ways to measure um, 
to look at how, how much time does GNOME Shell take to render a frame. Um, so you can take, for example, the average time to, to, to render a frame. Um, and in average, GNOME Shell does a pretty good job at keeping um, all the frames displayed without missing them. Um, but we have a pretty bad case of the maximum time to um, render a frame. So when GNOME Shell and Mutter misses a frame, it misses it pretty badly. So oh, we have frames that are missed pretty badly. That's what I mean. Um, and sometimes it's more important that you have, you know, if you have an, a, a one second animation running at 60 frames per second, which means 60 frames, perhaps it's more, perhaps no, it's more important to deliver 40 frames per second consistently than deliver 50 frames per second in a stuttery state. So there are various ways to look at this question, but the uh, point is Gnome Shell already does a good job at keeping um, things smooth, but things are getting better in the sense of we are missing less, not that we are giving more. Um, but we are reaching the point where we can start reducing the average, not the maximum. Um, apologies if that, that, that was not clear from the presentation, but the point is that we are reducing the well, f the focus was to reduce the, ma the, the, the pretty bad cases. But now, um, I think we're in a good position to start looking at the average cases. Um, when clutter hits the perfect path, the time GNOME shell takes to render is very close to zero milliseconds. So that's already an excellent case. And we hit that at around 50% uh, of the time. So, yeah. I hope that answers your question. Any other questions? What's kernel mode setting for and why do you need to do it every frame just for a complete newbie? So every frame you flip the content to the screen. So every frame is different, so you have to flip at a, a different kind of content. And for example, if you uh, animate something, while you animate it, it might move around the, to the screen and then we won't be able to use any hardware overlays to, uh, to put the, the content in and then suddenly it stops moving or maybe it becomes full screen or not covered by something else, and when that frame happens, we want to put uh, a, certain, uh, a certain surface in a hardware overlay, for example. So every frame we have to check this to be able to see what can we avoid compositing. Can we avoid compositing completely and just present one single thing or just present one background image and then one uh, surface on the top? And since every frame is different, we have to do this every frame. No more questions? Cool. Fantastic. <laughs> All right, thanks everybody. <laughs>